has stopped. This meeting is being recorded. Umagyana Tivinandasya Yanan Janishana Kaya Chakshurun Milatam Yena Asmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pascha Kilesha Tarine Pancha Kalpataru Yascha Kupasindhu Pavacha Patitanam Pavanibhu Vaishnavibhu Namunamaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shrivasa the Gaura Pata Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna So Let me just link my tablet. Can you make me a host on the tablet also from where I've joined? Sure, so this is a theme that comes repeatedly in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And sometimes the repetition of a particular theme brings about a certain level of clarity. And sometimes, can you please, Chaitanya Charan has logged in from another place also. Can you please make that a host also? One second. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhuji, it's done. Done? Okay. So, when the same, when a, some similar theme comes repeatedly in the Srimad Bhagavatam, we can consider multiple things, you know, that the repetition conveys some emphasis and the repetition is important. So here, we'll try to look at the repetition from the broader point of view of the Srimad Bhagavatam's emphasis. So in one sense, Daksha here, is actually speaking something which is in one sense contrary to the message of the Bhagavatam. He says, Aho sa sadho sadhuna sadhu lingen nastvaya asadhu akari arbhakana bikshor marga pradarshitaha. So, Aho asadho sadhuna asadho sadhuna that although you are among the society of, you're supposed to be a member of the saintly, you have acted in an unsaintly way. Sadhu lingena nastvaya. Linga means externals. Linga basically means, generally the literal translation, of, the common translation of the word linga is gender. Sri linga, pul linga, napulsak linga, like that. But linga also means the external marks. When a, new baby, when a baby is newborn, then the bodily marks help us understand which gender it is. So linga is refers to the externals. Sadhu lingena nastvaya. So you have the externals of sadhu, but you are not a sadhu. Asadhu akari arbakana. So asadhu akari. So you have dishonestly, in an unsaintly way, arbakana. Arbak is the children. Bikshor margaha pradarshitaha. That bikshor margaha. You have put them on the path of renunciation. So the Srimad Bhagavatam instructs in various ways. One of the consistent ways in which the Bhagavatam instructs is by what we can call as contrast. So contrast means that the Bhagavatam highlights the importance of a particular path by contrasting with the other paths. So right here in the sixth canto itself, we will see that there's a contrast between both uh, karma kanda or karma yoga and jnana kanda versus bhakti yoga. And that was through the 
a jamil pastime where the point was that a jamil that that sins the the sinful reactions can be countered by atonement but that but the sinful sinful mentality still remains and the sinful activities also relapse by jala kanda one can temporarily stop sinful actions also but the tendency remains and one will relapse but it's only by bhakti yoga that the sinful tendency itself will be removed so here here another contrast is being highlighted now that is the contrast between the path of karma that is one path and the other is the path of bhakti so now among these two paths each person the exponent of each path is embodied in a particular person so the embodiment of the path of karma is daksha and the path of the and the embodiment of the path of bhakti is narada now when this contrast is being drawn out at one level it may seem like it's a contrast between the householder life and the renounced life and it is true but it is not that simple the bhagavatam's focus by the way is my audio clear or it is not very clear it is clear probably very clear okay thank you it's clear okay good so sometimes the contrast now i will explain why the contrast can seem between the grahastha and the renounced order but let's focus on the principle over here See, the bhagavatam is focused on drawing the contrast between various paths that were available for people so in the traditional vedic context now there is the path of gradual piety so this is you could say moderate piety what piety is punya if there is moderate piety then this takes one to to pitraloka it is not when we say pitraloka it does not mean that all of one's ancestors independent of their karma just go to one abode rather what it means is that in general in the past people were pious and those with average piety would go to pitraloka now those with extraordinary piety would go to so you could say high piety very high piety those would go to swarga so swarga is not an ordinary attainment it requires extraordinary piety and then in contrast to this is the path that was feared and this is the path to narak so this is the path of uh, narak loka and who goes there is the sinful those who do path they go to narak loka so now in general it was understood that the most householders most grahasthas would be on one of these two paths this is the path of grihasthas and this is the path of grahamedhis of course it is not just grahamedhis now the bhagavatam has a particular uh, framework in which it is spoken hmm? that means that whether it is india or the west uh, in the past even a few hundred years before hmm, even people who were very attached people who were very materialistically minded even they would understand that they have to take some responsibility that's why even for somebody is attached grahamedhi was there 
Now, if we consider in today's world, we could say there is a path to a greater hell, which would be completely irresponsible form of enjoyment, where a person does not even take material responsibility, where people just have, uh, say, premarital sex, extramarital sex, and all kinds of uh, sexually deviant behaviors. So, but the Bhagavatam is speaking at particular reference points. The Grahamedis are those who are so attached to worldly life that they pay no attention to dharma. Now, in contrast to all these is the path of bhakti. The path of bhakti exists in another category itself. And this will take us to Swarga. Will it take us to Swarga? No. It will take us to the spiritual world, to Vaikuntha or Goloka. So it's a completely different category. So when Krishna says these, all these three parts, if you put, they are all in the samsara chakra. They are all in the samsara chakra, all these parts. But only the path of bhakti can take one outside the samsara chakra. Samsara chakra is abrahma bona loka punaravarti no arjuna. That one goes across this world in the cycle of birth and death. So the Bhagavatam's primary, now no, with this broad categorization, so while the contrast can be between uh, can be between, uh, so the contrast that is being drawn over here is, so this, this we'll have to move from here, this Daksha is actually over here. So in this particular trajectory, actually Narada is over here. Naraguni is over here and he is inspiring the sons of Daksha to go over here. And Daksha is somewhere over here. He is also a pious person. So now, with this broad understanding, I just short, small, it's the scale. So bhakti exists outside this gamut entirely. It's interesting. There's some lag over here. Okay, after I depict it, it takes some time to come on the screen, but it's okay. So now with this particular diagram in mind, now, actually, let's make it slightly different now. Let's try to differ it. In the path of bhakti itself, we could say there are two lanes. And in the path, the, both of these are the paths of bhakti. And bhakti practiced in the renounced order and bhakti practiced in the householder order. So bhakti does not fall in the category of the, uh, when somebody is practicing bhakti, they do not, they cannot be compared with those who are following the karma marga. The karma marga is the marga by which, by which one tries to um, gain a better position in the world. So if a devotee is practicing bhakti seriously, whether the bhakti devotee is a grahastha or a, or a sannyasi or a brahmachari or whatever, though both such devotees are focused on attaining Krishna. Krishna is their goal. Now, relatively speaking, if we compare with these other parts, you now the other parts are like this. Just to put it in scale now. Because as con compared with the from the absolute perspective, the difference between Pitraloka and Svargaloka is not much. So actually, this is the entire Samsara Chakra. And here there is Narakloka. So as compared to this, the contrast between these two is not too much. Between the renounced order and the householder order. Because both of them are following Bhakti. Now sometimes within the Bhagavatam, if we do not understand the Bhagavatam very carefully, we might equate the surrounded order with the bhakti marga and the householder order with the karma marga. And if we do that, that is a categorical mistake. 
it is a categorical mistake means it is a mistake in categorization we are placing one thing in an uncategorized which does not belong to it it is a categorization mistake that means what are we doing if we equate if we equate householder devotees if we equate householder devotees with karmakandis in the karmakanda marga there is only householders are there they are not equal at all now karmakandis now the karmakandis may also practice the brahmacharya vrata initially but that is so that they can get some punya and by which they can have good progeny so for them brahmacharya is not meant to attain brahman it is meant primarily to gain punya so that they can get uh, uh, good progeny putra and other things like that so this this is not the same category at all householder devotees and karmakandis are very different categories so what is the difference why are the difference the internal motivation is is different is we could say totally different why is it different because the householder devotees are aiming for krishna and they are, the karmakandis are aiming for punya and a better life in this world or the next world so these two are very very different now with this broad categorization in understood now let's move forward and look at a couple of points why sometimes these two are made similar so shila prabhupad when he categorizes say the renounced order and the householder order his focus is primarily on on in on emphasizing that if we are attached to the world attachment will lead to entanglement that is this primary focus and with that focus in mind what happens is attachment will lead to entanglement and that is what is to be avoided so prabhupad's primary concern is not to trash any particular order his primary concern is to protect us from attachment and if you keep this principle in mind that there can be attachment in the householder life there can be attachment in the renounced order life in this particular context see what happens is in general whichever path a person follows that person is often gets convinced that my path is the best path and they start thinking that any other path is actually a path of illusion and krishna points to this daksha mentality in 2.4243 in the bhagavad gita where he talks about karma kanda and he says that na anyad asti iti vadinah that they think there is no other way than this kamatmanah swarga para janma karma phala pradam kriya vishesh bahulam bhogaishwarya gatim prati they think bhoga and aishwarya is the primary purpose of life and kamatmanah swarga para janma karma phala pradam kriya vishesh bahulam bhogaishwarya gatim prati so krishna uses this and krishna says later on that bhoga next verse he says bhogaishwar prasaktana taya aparita chetasam vyavasayatmika buddhi samadhau navidhiyate so what krishna says here is that basically in 2.4243 he says that these people basically think that that the path of the purpose of life is to get punya and to thereby get bhoga and aishwarya in either in this world or in the other world bhoga the bhoga is sense sense pleasure aishwarya is wealth we know hiranyakashipu had these two things hiranya refers is wealth and kashipu refers the bed bed is a place where bhoga is done but they think this is the purpose of life 
As Krishna says, if this, you think this is the purpose of life, then samadhau na vidhiyate. And such a person cannot get samadhi, Krishna says. It's not possible. Samadhi means the state of inner absorption, inner satisfaction. That is not possible, Krishna says. So, now, here, Daksha, because he is convinced that his path is right, so now, does he not know that liberation is required? That liberation is uh, what is the ultimate goal? He says, yes, that is true, but that requires a long, long process of evolution. So see, in the normal way of living, there is, so let's try to understand this a little bit more. Now, if you consider the traditional conception of life. So this is, this, if you consider this as life, then here there's a first phase, which is the Brahmacharya phase. Then there is the Grahastha phase. Then there is the Vanaprastha phase. And there is, there is the Sannyasa phase. And generally speaking, these three are the place where one practices Karma Kanda. And this is the place where one starts practicing Jnana Kanda. So karma kanda means in brahmachari life, one is following the rules of celibacy. And while the, while the males, we go to the ashram, the guru to stay. And it's not that every single male would go. Lord Ram, neither Lord Ram nor the Pandavas actually went and lived in the ashram of the guru. But that was a, that is one way of growing. But the idea was practice celibacy. And, and the females would in their homes practice chastity. And basically, both would acquire punya. And in grahastha life, they would continue to do pious activities, continue to do dharma. And karma kanda means that we have dharma, artha, and kama. These three are what are the pursuits of life. These are the purusharthas. And karma kanda is done for these three things. And then after that, in jnana kanda, one starts looking for moksha. So, now from this perspective, if, if a person simply has this karma kanda conception, their idea is that unless a person has grown sufficiently, unless a person has experienced the pleasures of life, unless a person has gone beyond the pleasures of life, jumping from here to here, is actually unhealthy. It is premature and it is unhealthy. Why? Because a person does not have the maturity. A person does not have the renunciation. So a person does not have the realization. So there is no realization. That is the idea over here. And because there is no realization, jumping from brahmacharya life to sannyas life is not a good idea. Now, Daksha is not the kind of materialist that we would think of today as materialist. Today as materialists, they have no idea of maintaining celibacy of any kind. You know, nowadays, this society has become so, so tragically or horrifically perverted that many young people actually proudly, many of these movie stars and other stars, they proudly put on their, their websites, you know, I lost my virginity at this age. And they cheer, oh, this was your first, uh, that first sexual experience, as they call it. So it is something, it is, so as compared to today's materialists, Daksha is way, way higher up. So even he asked his children to practice celibacy, but he expected them to follow this path. And he was saying, Arbhakana, these are children. They do not have the maturity to actually renounce the world. And therefore, you are misleading them. This is his understanding, his Dakshad understanding. However, now, if we consider from the Bhakti perspective, from the Bhakti perspective, if we consider, say, Krishna is here. And from wherever we are, Sarva Karmanya Pisada Kurvano Mavatya Pashriya Mat Prasada Dava Pnoti Shashvatam Padamavyam Krishna says. 
that wherever you are, this is 1856 in the Gita Krishna says, that wherever you are, Sarva Karmanya Pisada. So, from wherever you are, you take shelter of me. So, in one sense, for a devotee, we could say that we can take shelter of Krishna from anywhere. So, if we consider in the lifespan, this is Brahmacharya, this is Grahastha, this is Vanaprastha, and this is Sanyas. So, from a devotee perspective, Uh, actually, wherever a person is at, from there, they can take shelter of Krishna. And they can be elevated. So, now, culture, from a devotional perspective, from devotional perspective, the important thing is that one takes shelter of Krishna. So, so shelter of Krishna from anywhere. Anywhere means any ashram. Any place, the idea is one wants to take shelter of Krishna. And depending on how much shelter of Krishna one has taken, how much dependence on, dependence on Krishna one has, one will actually be elevated and one is considered elevated. So Mahaprabhu is a sannyasi, but Mahaprabhu took instruction from Mahaprabhu took instruction from Ramanandarai, who was a Grahastha. And the same Srimad Bhagavatam will later demonstrate something else. So here, like I made the point, it might seem like this is a, a condemnation of Grahastha Ashram and it is a glorification of the Sanyas Ashram. It's not that simple. We will look at another point over here. We will see later on in the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is a contrast between Ambarish Maharaj and Durvasa Muni. And what happens over here is the Bhagavatam clearly shows that Ambarish Maharaj is far, far greater than Durvasa Muni. Now, Durvasa Muni thinks he is superior because his idea is that he is thinking that you know, from, from one perspective, See, it is like the Brahmacharya Grahastha. Now, Vanaprastha, we don't see any major, many Vanaprasthas in the Bhagavatam directly. It is conceptually understood that Vanaprastha is a transitional ashram generally. So, and the Sanyas ashram. So, now what happens is, that in one sense, the sannyas ashram is culturally respected. Culturally, those who renounce the world are respected. So what Durvasa Muni was thinking is that I am here. Durvasa Muni was thinking I am up here. And the Ambarish Maharaj is down here. So Durvasa Muni's conception. So now what happened because of this is, now this conception, because of that he thought, how dare Durvas, how dare he not respect me? How dare he <clears throat> disrespect me <clears throat> by taking food before having offered to food to me? However, what the Bhagavatam shows that Durvasa Muni, in one sense, was practicing Jnana Kanda. And if you consider from the perspective of Krishna, Durvasa Muni was down here and Ambarish Maharaj was up here. So Ambarish Maharaj had taken great shelter of Krishna. And Durvasa Muni, yeah, his ultimate purpose was Krishna, but he was more of a, more of a Jnani. He knew about Vishnu, but even when he went to Vaikuntha afterwards, he sought protection from the Sudarshan Chakra. He did not say, oh, now come to Vaikuntha, let me stay over here. So Ambarish Maharaj was actually much, much greater than, uh, than Dhruva Samuni. So the idea over here is 
that the Bhagavatam contrast is here between Bhakti Yoga is greater than Jnana Kanda. So in the fourth canto, the Bhagavatam contrasting Bhakti Yoga and Karma Kanda. And here it is contrasting Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Kanda. And it is showing that Bhakti Yoga is the highest path. Those who take shelter of Krishna are the highest. And that is why for us, when we are trying to practice Bhakti, you know, we don't have to make a huge you and cry, a, a, a huge fuss about the renounced order or the uh, householder order. The important thing is practice Bhakti. Yes, culturally, we offer respect to the renounced order. But we see in the Chaitanya Charita Amrit that Mahaprabhu among the Panchi Tattva actually Sri Vastaka or Radhavata Acharya, they are all Grahasthas. And we have Mithyanand Prabhu who is also not technically a sannyasi, he is Audhut sannyasi. He also becomes a Grahastha. So the point is, we may say, okay, they are not like, they, they are not like us, they are very exalted Grahasthas. Well, that is true, but then we can say that the sannyasis at that time were also very exalted sannyasis. So the point here is not to minimize any order, whether the Brahmachari order or Grahastha order. We see that here, Advaita Acharya, Srivas Thakur, Nityanand Prabhu, they're all Grihasthas. So, in our tradition, while renunciation is definitely praised, we have the very famous phrase where Ravana Das Goswami, his renunciation, Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu Bhakta Ganer, Vairagya Pradhan. When Ravana Das Goswami, it is, his renunciation pleases the Lord. But the point is, something very significant. You know, we don't see while Raghunadas Goswami's renunciation is glorified, that is not at the cost of minimizing anyone else. You know, when Raghunadas Goswami was renounced and Mahaprabhu was praising him so much, at that time, there were associates of Mahaprabhu like Ramanand Rai. Then there was... There were associates of Mahaprabhu like Ramanand Rai and we have Sarom Bhattacharya who later became associates. They were Grahasthas and we don't see them feeling insecure, worried, constantly resenting, I am so fallen, when will I renounce, I am entangled. We don't see that, nor do we see that in any of the other associates of Mahaprabhu. So the point is, we understand that wherever we are, we focus on taking shelter of Krishna. And for taking shelter of Krishna, the key principle, we conclude with this point, key principle is anukulyasya sankalpa pratikulyasya varjanam. We accept that which is anukul and we avoid that which is pratikul. So now, you could say that the renounced order is more anukul for bhakti. In the renounced order, we can practice bhakti better. In the in the household order, we cannot practice it better. Well, maybe, maybe not. Because everybody has a particular nature, everybody has a particular disposition. But one thing we have to understand is so what we have to understand is what is anukul for us is <clears throat> acceptance. Acceptance of the present situation we are in, that is a part of our surrender to Krishna. And pratikul is resentment. If you look at the Gita's example, Arjuna felt Initially, very resentful. Why do I have to fight this war? Why do I have to fight this war? I don't want to fight this war. But what happened was actually, overall, after hearing the Gita, Arjuna understood that yes, this is this is where I am meant to be right now, and let me do my duty wholeheartedly. 
Now, yes, maybe in future for all of us, maybe the renounced order may be more favorable, maybe less, less engagement in the world may be more favorable. But resenting where we are right now, that is never favorable. If our emotional energy is going in resentment, then that is unfavorable for our bhakti. So what we need to do is, in bhakti, there is both. When we, when we surrender to Krishna, there is accepting, ultimately, my situation is under Krishna's plan. And there is aspiring. Both are required. If there is only accepting, oh, you know, this is the situation Krishna has put me, what can I do? You know, I have a job which takes 16 hours work and I can't do anything about it. I don't have time to chant. I don't have time to practice bhakti. No, if there's only accepting, then there is passivity. If there is only accepting without, if there's only aspiring without accepting, then, then that is what? That is passion. That is Rajoguna. Where, so this is only, if there's only accepting, that is tamas. If there's only aspiring, then there is rajas. But, when there is accepting plus aspiring. So then what will happen is, then we will move higher up. So accepting is in this case associated with dhiryat, patience from the Uddesh Amrut. Then aspiring is associated with Utsahan. And then there is, we accept, we aspire, and then we wait. Waiting means not passively waiting, we are aspiring, but waiting, this is Dhairyat. Sorry, Utsahan, this is Nishchay. Sorry, Utsahan, Nishchaya, Dhairyat. So, enthusiasm, patience, and faith. So, So nishchay is sorry, nishchay, sorry, nishchayad. So that we have faith. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna knows my situation, and in due course, Krishna will arrange a more favorable situation for me to practice bhakti. So let me accept the situation I am in. Let me aspire to serve him as much as he can, as I can, and let me wait faithfully. So when we have this attitude, then our attitude overall will be anukul to bhakti. And as our attitude is Anukul Bhakti, we will move onwards in our journey toward Krishna. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. Broadly, I discussed three points. That first point was about the contrast. It is this contrast is not so much between Grahastha and Sanyasa. It is not Grahastha versus actually it's not Grahastha versus Sanyas as it is as it is karma kanda versus bhakti yoga so and how can we know that because the other example here is that the same bhagavatam offers another contrast where apparently grahasthas are considered to be higher than brahmachas sanyasis and that is the pastime of ambarish maharaj durvasamuni this is the contrast of Narad Muni and Daksha Prajapati. So here, what is the, 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 the contrast? It is not with Rasta Sanyasi. There the, the contrast between Jnana Kanda versus Bhakti Yoga. And for us, rather than making a categorical mistake of uh, equating Grahastas with Karma Kandis and Sanyasis with, uh, with Bhaktas, we understand that all of them are Bhaktas. Everyone is taking shelter of Krishna. And we focus on how somebody is taking shelter of Krishna and taking shelter of Krishna, we accept what is Anukul and we avoid that which is Pratikul. And what is Pratikul is, we avoid resentment. Or why am I caught in this order? We focus on accepting, aspiring, and waiting. Utsahan, Nishchaya, Dhairyat. And that's way, from wherever we are, we can take shelter of Krishna and move closer to him. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments?
थैंक यू सो मच प्रभुजी ज्योति माता जी प्लीज बोल हरे कृष्णा धनवत प्रणाम प्रभु जी प्रभु जी आई हैव थ्री क्वेश्चन वन क्वेश्चन इज यू ड्रू अ लाइन एंड यू से दैट देर इज अ लैक ऑफ मैच्यूरिटी वेन वन हैज थिंक ऑफ गोइंग फ्रॉम ब्रह्मचारी आश्रम टू सन्यास आश्रम वन हु डज लाइक दैट नो वाई क्वेश्चन दिस वॉज अंकिंग ऑफ दक्ष प्रजापति आई वॉज सेंग दैट Daksha uh-huh. Prajapati is thinking that if somebody jumps from Brahmacharya to Sanyas, then that is that is why he is criticizing them. But my point was, if somebody is in the Brahmacharya life, if somebody is Brahmachari, and they feel that that Brahmachari life is in the Brahmachari life is until no cool for their bhakti, and that is how they want to continue. So then that is something which is very different. So his reasoning is. If somebody he reasoning is true, if somebody not practicing bhakti, if somebody is practicing bhakti, then bhakti gives higher taste. So this is actually Daksha's thinking. This is not necessarily the universal way of thinking. But if somebody is practicing bhakti as a brahmachari and they get the higher taste by practicing bhakti, then they then actually it's not that they are jumping from here to here. Basically, what they are doing is they are simply from wherever they are, they are taking shelter of Krishna. This brahmachari, just the one person, the nyasi. Everybody is taking shelter of Krishna. Okay. True, Prabhu ji. Uh, but my point is, uh, you you mentioned one word like maturity is important. Yes. Correct. So I want I want your explanation on what what is the maturity because even if one one follows the varna ashrama, like say if he if he uh, is very sincere, goes from brahma brahmachari to van prast means the household the grahas life then the van prast and then the sanyasi even he follows everything which is in sync with the instructions and there is a lack of maturity per se so that, then there is no point of saying that this is the way so okay that was my question okay. like what is the your definition of maturity means what is the explanation of that maturity because either of the way the maturity is important okay so what is maturity see in the case of bhakti <clears throat> there are maturity means three things uh, let uh, let let understand the three things you know there is if we consider say a person is here and say this is the material world now there can be two there can be various ranges of emotions with respect to the material world even from a negative perspective there can be there can be frustration so there can be frustration there can be aversion and there can be renunciation and these three are not the same thing frustration is one thing then this is aversion and this is renunciation and beyond this if we consider here is krishna here there is attraction and absorption so what is the difference between these three things see frustration means there is the so broadly speaking look at this frustration means what that the desire is there but the ability is not there many of us know the sorry the desire is there when there is frustration the desire is there the ability is not there the resources are not there so you know somebody is fasting because um, they have a severe stomach upset uh, they really want there the feast outs around it everybody is seeing the feast they want to eat the feast 
but they can't eat because their body can't digest it. That is not renunciation. So frust frustration means desire is there, but ability is not there. In contrast, when we talk about renunciation, what happens is the desire is not there. Even if the ability may be there. Ability means many times, now of course in India, monks are becoming cool. But in the few years before, if somebody heard that a monk was that, oh, you are a well-educated person, then why did you become a monk? People used to think that, oh, you couldn't achieve anything in life. That's why you became a monk. That is a general idea. So renunciation means one ha has the ability to enjoy the world, but one had chosen not to enjoy it. Now, aversion is something which is in between. I'll explain what it means. But for us, frustration is not the, so frustration is not the same as renunciation. And frustration is not the qualification for renunciation. So when we say maturity, maturity means what? In this context, that is not frustration, it's actual renunciation. It's not maturity means, you know, oh, you know, my st engineering start, I'm studying engineering, this engineering studies are so frustrating. The job competition is so difficult. You know, to try to find a good match is so difficult. If I get into all this, I just renounce the world. So one is renouncing not so much because one has, one has any higher taste or higher purpose. It's just the difficulties with the world. That's why one is renouncing. And that is not mature renunciation. Because what will happen is, <clears throat> late, right now, the ability is not there. So one may feel that, okay, why should I enjoy? Let, let me just give it up. But later on, if somebody feels, so oh, now, maybe I have the ability now. Maybe I can enjoy. So one may have that problem. Now, if you consider attraction to Krishna, which leads to absorption, attraction which leads to absorption what that means is it is not so much the desire is not there rather if we consider the desire for krishna is so strong mam ichhaptum dhananjaya that as compared to that this desire for the material world and the objects therein becomes insignificant so this becomes insignificant and this becomes predominant, you can say dominant. So maturity in this context means that one understands clearly that either this desire is very strong or at least one is cultivating this desire very strongly. One is strongly practicing the process by which to get this desire. And as contrast with that, aversion means what? Aversion means, say, if I, if this person is over here, there might be some attraction to Krishna. But the key thing is, there is, if you have the material world, there is a lot of aversion from the material world. Aversion means what over here? One wants to push the material world away. This way, you know. That means I move away from it, you go away from it. And there's a, not just some aversion, but very, very strong aversion. So the prominent emotion in one's consciousness is this material world is a terrible place. Now, okay, this world is a terrible place is okay in, as an emotion to have. But what is much more important to that is not that the material world is dreadful, but Krishna is wonderful. Krishna consciousness, we should focus on how Krishna is wonderful. That should be the primary part in our consciousness. Not material world is dreadful. This can be there, but this is what is primary. And this can be secondary. So what happens in aversion, this is what becomes primary. And that is why there is a major problem. So, uh, so when we say maturity, maturity means that one has gone beyond frustration, one has gone beyond aversion, and one is not only situated in renunciation, but there's renunciation of the world, and there is attraction toward Krishna. So this is the healthy state to be. Now, how one comes to that healthy state? It is not automatically just by practicing bhakti in the through the brahmachari, grahastha, vanaprastha, then one will come to that state. No, it takes time. And not only take time, it takes, it takes diligent practice. 
So in general, it is it requires the cultivation of the higher taste. Okay. To the point, Prabhuji, um, you said that the Krishna is the, there is a desire, right? So the desire to when we we get attracted to Krishna, so that desire is very strong, right? So is that desire will dissolve the frustration and aversion in in the practice? Is it so? Yes, as our desire for Krishna will increase. Our desire for worldly things will decrease automatically. No, the frustration and aversion. Say a person is renounced, and he even after the renouncement, that say it is out of the frustration he has renounced, and he then he has some aversion also. So like some frustration and aversion is always there, and then the desire is going gradually. Means it's like. Uh, yeah. It's like that's fine. So initially, so, the initial start, the bhakti, desire, the initial start of bhakti, that so, so that's okay. I understood your question. If I'm let me just repeat it. Yeah, See, yeah. The, initially, our start to bhakti can be from frustration. It can even be from aversion. That is okay. But eventually, one has to come to the platform of attraction for Krishna. Initially, we may start practicing bhakti because we experience so much frustration in life. Maybe we have been betrayed in our relationship. We have experienced experience heartbreaks. And that's why I feel I want to take shelter of Krishna. That is my primary relationship. And that is good. But eventually, it's that if we do not develop attraction toward Krishna, then what will happen is, see, initially when what happens is, we say if we are interacting with the material world and we experience some negativity in the material world, then basically our focus is to go away from the material world. And Krishna just happens to be one goal. But eventually the journey toward Krishna is a long process. And so initial impetus is fine that it may be frustration for the world. The initial impetus is frustration, that is okay. But when frustration can, can initiate or can start our spiritual journey, frustration can't sustain our spiritual journey. So if we consider the soul is here, the soul wants to go toward Krishna. So frustration can start the journey. But if you want to continue on, then for that, we need attraction. We need to develop attraction to Krishna. Only when develop attraction, then we can attain Krishna. Is that okay? Yes, Prabhuji. My second question you have answered already. So um, the third question is, Prabhuji, what is your inner strength? What drives you? Because I feel there is a lot of inner strength to analyze everything. We need a lot of inner strength to come into that practicality to understand this stuff. So I'll be grateful if you could uh, tell what is your transformation or what is the drive that you have or what is the inner strength that you have? I don't know if I have inner strength, you. but basically I feel I'm simply using my Swabhav in Krishna's service. Krishna has given me an analytical nature and basically, you know, if we use what we have for Krishna's service, then we could see generally we talk only about these two things, you know, there's a lower taste and there's a material lower taste and there is a spiritual higher taste. And we think that we have to go from here to here. But actually this journey is a very, very long journey. So to sustain us on this journey, what we can say, we can say is that we can call this something like a devotional, let's put it this way, a dharmic higher taste. By what do I mean by dharmic higher taste? that we all have our dharma. Some of us have Brahminical nature, some of us have Kshatriya nature, some of us have Vaishya nature, whatever nature we have. And we don't have to put ourselves in a particular nature. We can just look at what are the things that we're naturally attracted to. So if some of us are attracted to, are attracted to music, then whenever we have some time, we can direct our thoughts towards music. And we can remember Krishna's, uh, Krishna's musical composition, musical song, and that will give us higher taste. So we have to find out this dharmic higher taste which will sustain us from the journey from the lower taste to the higher taste. So for me, it is analysis. 
for others it may be dt worship for others it may be singing for somebody else in the distribution so i think we have to find out according to our swabhava what is it that now is my analysis spiritual or is it simply intellectual well i would say it is mostly intellectual but it's intellectual used for a spiritual purpose so like that you all of us have a particular nature and we use that nature in krishna service okay prabhu ji how you introspect about it well i think for me mainly hari krishna jyoti mata it's mainly through writing it's mainly through writing because i have been writing every day on the gita daily so for writing i have to think very deeply that's how i have been able to do it mostly mm-hmm. so writing and journaling okay, thank, thank you so much thank you so much yes thank you so much jyoti mata ji devotees we have so many devotees waiting on the line so please ask one question for uh, devotee so that uh, it's easy for Ramangira. others also to follow up ramangi radhika mata ji please go Hare Krishna, uh, Prabhu Ji, Dhanwad Pranam. Thank you yeah. for the wonderful, um, enlightening class, Prabhu Ji. Prabhu Ji, I have a question uh, uh, on renunciation from Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Prabhu Ji, in text 9, um, the renunciation in the mode of goodness and text 23, uh, karma, action in the mode of goodness, uh, <clears throat> we see that uh, the performer performs the action without attachment to the work or without attachment to the fruit itself. so my question is uh, uh, this this uh, appears to be a karma prabhu ji then there is no reaction correct no mm-hmm. no attra- attachment to the fruit then uh, how we can differentiate a person on the transcendental pat- platform and a person in the mode of goodness both appear to be doing the same kind of action which has no reaction yes. see the difference between the mode of goodness and transcendence is oh, what is one attracted to a person sattva guna sattva basically they have they their primary focus their primary virtue is equanimity they understand that in the material world things come and go problems come and go successes come and go they are not really the big thing and in shuddha sattva prime it is krishna who is the primary reality so in transcendental platform it is not just one is not attached to the fruits of one's work actually one is one one is attached to krishna so 926 27 is this level where krishna talks about how patram pushpam phalam toyam and mat yat karoshi rasnasi ajjuhosi dadasiyat so that is at the, that is at the bhakti level so it is not yeah we should be equipoised and detached from the results But bhakti is defined not so much by detachment from the results as attachment to Krishna. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, then uh, the de- uh, Prabhuji destination of uh, uh, destination of a person in mode of goodness <coughs> is going to the great uh, sages, uh, planets of great sages. So <coughs> that means yeah. So the activity they do uh, is not a pious activity, right? <coughs> well it depends yeah so uh, pious in the sense pious and impious uh, are done in the mode of passion is that a correct understanding prabhu ji <coughs> yes and no see in piety also there are grades we cannot have a mayavadi understanding of piety so piety at one level can be immediate results that means you know that i do some vrata and then after 3 months i expect some result and piety can be next life results in swarga actually we can have some in between here this next life in swarga can be slightly above and then beyond that or other we can have here hmm, several decades like we had we have in the bhagavatam 
they're practicing brahmacharya for not just a few months but several years and then there can be next life tapaloka satyoga the destination above swarga so here if you consider that there are many people who may love reciting vishnu sahasranam or bhagavad gita or some other sacred chants just because they feel so good you know they are not really devoted to krishna there are many people who like bharatanatyam because it's just such a nice artistic form that uh, so that is sattvic happiness so like that in tapaloka it is piety it is not exactly bhakti but it is a very high level of piety where one doesn't want gross sense gratification even in the heavens one wants just a subtle gratification of the mind and the intellect where the mind is peaceful the intellect is contemplating higher truths krishna says sattva guna the attachment is to sukha sangena sadbhati gyana sangena chanaga so one feels very so in sattva there is the mind is peaceful so there is sukha there is no agitation of the mind in sattva guna so one doesn't feel restless one doesn't feel any craving for desire so it's peaceful and the intelligence is clear so there is gyana and there is a satisfaction in knowledge prabhu said this can also be golden shackles because one feels oh i am so peaceful just see all these all these people are running around here they are doing some things my things and then the intelligence is clear means that people are so oh i have so much more knowledge than everyone else i am wiser than everyone else and there is satisfaction in that so in so the sages do not have krishna centeredness may not have and that's why that's why it's not exactly the same it's not pure spiritual it is pointing towards the spiritual okay thank you thank you prabhu yes dev god mata ji it's fine thank you prabhu ji hari krishna dan vatram dev god mata ji hari krishna prabhu ji dan vatram all glories to shila prabhu pa thank you for wonderful class prabhu ji can you hear me yes yes please go ahead hari Yes, Prabhuji. So my question was uh, the Pitru Loka you explained in that chart. I just wanted to understand uh, whose destination is Pitru Loka. Who who are the people who go there? Because I thought birth and death cycle is for uh, like we take. That's what I explained. That's what I was not death, clear right? my explanation. So who are the ones? No, no. That's what I was explaining. See, like in normally, if a student if a student goes to college, hmm? say a student goes to your college. and then if they are going to college the natural result is graduation now some students may just fail or drop out and some students may graduate with honors so within the if you consider the vedic university the, so if you somebody goes to university or college the normal expectation is graduation so you study decently enough and you graduate from it so like that so if we consider the vedic university or the universe to be like a university then what happens is the normal result if somebody lives a life of piety is that is they will go to pitruloka so those who live a life of average punya and that is what is generally expected of our ancestors now some ancestors may live a life of extraordinary punya so graduation with honors that is like going to swarga and failing or dropping out that is like like going to narak that is a failure completely so who goes to it's not that all ancestors go to swarga pitruloka it is generally expected that our ancestors would have lived piously and therefore they would go to pitruloka but if the ancestors have been very pious then they would go higher to swarga yes sukar krishna prabhu Hare Krishna, Chaitanya uh, Charan Prabhu, your class are always very absorbing. Prabhu, I just want to recon some question I have heard from, I think one of the sub Bhakti Sangha only. There's uh, B. Dhruva Samuni. Uh, though he had uh, done this aparad, 
but it was a past time by krishna that krishna had given a uh, boon to ambarish uh, maharaj because of his uh, great uh, bhakti that sudarshan chakra will be always with him every time to protect him but just to remind him to reconfirm him he sent durva samani to go and do all these thing gadbad and all and then sudarshan chakra he changed it and finally proved that see sudarshan chakra could protect him again durva samani the same way bishma also though he was in the adharma side it was krishna's plan that he will remain with them and ultimately will end to see that the dharma is established and when then when yudhishthir and all going to meet him he is never bothered about his body he is just telling how are you you have been suffering so much that's why krishna gave him darshan by leaving his body so this is, i want to just your reconfirmation that that these are all past time then it's not that durva samani was bad and he was gyani and he wanted to just check so this this was told in, in bhakti sang only one of the i think a god brothers only so i just wanted since you are also in the same thing okay. i want to know and also arjuna they told that he is a pure devotee he is never any one more thing he has all uh, pure let's devotees take, let's take he one thing at a time ignorance. only let's krishna take, wanted let's, let's take one thing at a time you know we can go to 100 yeah. example like that let's take the principle yeah hmm? see in hmm. general scripture can be studied at various levels hmm? Hmm. there is at the transcendental level hmm. there is at the ethical level hmm. there is a literal level hmm. and then there is also in between a metaphorical level hmm. so literal level is just hear the stories there is no need for analysis that's like the traditional there will be uh, the ramayana like we have gita parayan yeah ramayana parayan just recite the ramayana that's all and just hear it you will hmm. be purified by it no need to analyze anything no need to draw any lessons from it this could be literal hmm. level so you could say at the literal level the primary result is there's entertainment there can be much more but there's entertainment now at the transcendental level there is ecstasy hmm. a devotee is seeing this is krishna everything is krishna's arrangement and we simply relish krishna's pastimes hmm? hmm now at a metaphorical level sometimes in our tradition metaphorical is not emphasized so much but proba talks about for example hmm. the six children who were in devaki's womb before krishna and balram appeared they represent the six anarthas that's something metaphorical mm. now the ethical is where we draw moral lessons and we should mm. not confuse the ethical and the transcendental we have to be clear which mm. framework we are analyzing from so if we start saying that mm. oh, everybody is transcendental then say if you mm. say all the part all the pe- people who were there at mahaprabhu's times they were all great souls mm. Mm? Mm. everybody at that time was a great soul then mm. that means they are already pavan then mahaprabhu is not patit pavan he is simply pavan pavan so no some of mahaprabhu's associates mm. were inti- Ma- some of mahaprabhu's associates were intimate eternal associates many others were fortunate that they happened mm. to be there and they were elevated by mahaprabhu mm. so generally if we are looking at the ethical level don't mix the transcendental over there hmm? Hmm. so now can the same past time be read at two different levels yes if we consider the hmm. past time of arjuna from one hmm. if we are looking at a transcendental level then arjuna is hmm. arjuna's illusion is by krishna's arrangement hmm. Hmm? that is the point to understand hmm. Uh, mm. but if you are looking at the ethical level then mm. we we can draw various lessons a prabhupad for example from the first uh, first chapter he says that arjuna is arjuna is so contemplative he is so thoughtful he is not rushing mm. into action and this shows that he is mm. qualified for gaining knowledge and then suddenly mm. in the as soon as the second chapter starts Prabhup, prabhupad seems to suddenly change and he says arjuna is so attached is crying this tear a sign of ignorance so say what's happening mm. why sudden change so the point is at ethical mm. level the focus is not so much on judging the character as on learning for ourselves not mm. so much on the focus is not on who is right mm. but it is on what is right or what is right means what is there for me to learn over here mm. so this is 
when we have this focus, then what happens is, so from the first chapter, Prabhupada is drawing the lesson that what is rice means, what can I learn? Mm. So from this, so when we have this focus, then the result is that we essentially learn, move toward Krishna by learning mm. what is important for us. So, mm. so then from this perspective, we can say that, yes, say for example, Arjuna was put into, Arjuna was reason, doing some reasoning in the first chapter and that he was reasoning was good. But yeah. his reasoning was mm. not his reasoning was not long term enough. Mm. It was not far sighted enough, and in that sense, it was inadequate. Mm. So we can draw different lessons in the Chitraketu pastime. For example, Prabhupada draws lessons from both perspectives. He says Chitraketu should not have been laughing. He says that you know when the great sages were not mm. laughing, why was Chitraketu laughing? But then after that, Prabhupada yeah. says that. Yeah. Uh, also, he says that. Mm, what is that? He says, uh, Durga, uh, uh, Parvati Devi, she should not have cursed, cursed uh, Chitraketu. You know, if none of the, if Lord Shiva himself did not take offense, if none of the sages took offense, why did mm. Parvati Devi have to take offense at that time? So the point is from both sides. You know, we if we are seeing our seniors, we should not be hasty in judging them, and from the, if we mm. are seniors, then we should not be hasty in condemning our juniors for some inappropriate behavior. So we can draw mm. more lessons. So when we are drawing, when we are analyzing at ethical level, if we bring in the transcendental, then everything becomes meaningless. And there's no use of any analysis. Mm. Yes, Arjuna's illusion could have been by Krishna's arrangement, but what mm. was the thought process of Arjuna by which he went into illusion? And how can we avoid that thought process? If we keep that mm. in mind, then there is something for us to learn. Okay? Mm. Because the way Krishna has killed all the Kauravas in the 11th chapter is telling me already dead, dead. I just wanted you to uh, get the yes, that's why I'm doing the whole thing. In the, after showing the Vishwarupa Darshan, no, everybody was yes, going sir. inside his mouth. So yeah. that means it was all Krishna wanted the Dharma to be established. He only did it, but he just made Arjuna to play the game. No, that's what we can understand at the end of the chapter that Krishna will make his devotees to get the yes, but Krishna is only doing everything. He only is punishing the people who are who yeah, disrobed the I am per, personally uncomfortable with emphasizing Krishna is doing everything because that almost takes away the room for free will of the individual. Mm. Now, a devotee always has free will, and a devotee with free yeah. will serves Krishna. So yes, it was Krishna's arrangement, but mm. Krishna could have made, Krishna could have fulfilled his arrangement another way also. Krishna told Arjuna, "If you do not fight, still the Kauravas will be killed." But ah, without you as an instrument. So, mm. so Krishna's arrangement is what is going to work always. But right. whether a particular soul will act in a particular way or not, that is up to that mm. soul. And that is why we want to focus on what we can learn from various actions. Mm. Okay. Since you are very analytical, that's why I ask this question. Because you, are, you go so deep into it and that's why... I wanted to re-clarify and find out, you know, if it's okay or not. That's why. Yes. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Prabhu. Wonderful. Prabhu. Wonderful. Prabhu. Thank, Prabhu. Thank, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. Radhika Mataji, do you have a question? Adhika already asked. Yes, Mataji. Prabhuji. Okay. okay, you asked a question, you didn't. Yeah. Prabhuji, yeah. I have one. Okay, please, we'll ask question. Prabhuji, I have one more question. Okay, last question, then we'll stop. Please, Prabhuji, sorry very much. Yes, yes, Prabhuji. Prabhuji, uh, on the path of Nishkam Karma Yoga, uh, the performer will be performing according to 2.47. And so then if he is not able to achieve attraction to Krishna, so we, uh, we, uh, the understanding is that he, still he will be in the mode of goodness. He will not be able to transcend the mode. That is my question actually, uh, when I was asking about renunciation in the 18th chapter. So okay. what makes him transcend the mode? Uh. It, what inspires them to transcend the modes? Well, it is the practice of bhakti. It is the association of devotees. It is the, it is basically, if there is no, if we can say devotion, it involves various things. There is attraction to Krishna or there is 
there is desire or we could say we have to use the language we use here aspiration for attraction to krishna that means one wants that attraction even if there is not there and at the least is appreciation for those who are attracted to krishna that is agnyat sukriti so all these are broadly within the range of bhakti so yes ma'am so somebody sattva guna how will they move towards uh, shuddha sattva it is either by appreciating devotees or by strength self practicing bhajan so this is basically appreciation for those who are this is sadhu sangha bhajan kriya you know shraddha sadhu sangha that the stages come up over here adho shraddha it is to sadhu sangha and an aspiration mm-hmm. means one is actually doing bhajan kriya and going towards anath nivritti and from here onwards <clears throat> ruchi asakti bhav they start coming up this is the stage of primarily of bhajan kriya so that's how one will gradually move towards attraction toward krishna so otherwise nishkam karma yogi cannot transcend the modes right prabhu ji if he is not developing okay. any kind of See, uh, association or attraction nishkam karma yogi nishkam karma yogi they can attain brahman but they won't attain bhakti if they have no calm for this world then they will go to brahman there cannot be absolutely no attachment to krishna even then they will be uh, transcending the modes and going to brahman jyoti brahma jyoti prabhu ji some part of bhakti should be there even for nishkam karma yoga it is said in bhagavatam na okay see this is a complex question now basically there is विश्वास को से एक्सप्लेन दैट भक्ति इज रिक्वायर्ड इन ऑल पार्ट्स बट इट्स लाइक देयर अ डिफरेंस बिटवीन से भक्ति योगा एंड अदर योगास विद भक्ति इन देम यस प्रभु द डिफरेंस इज दैट दैट इन भक्ति योगा कृष्णा इज बोथ द मींस एंड द गोल whereas in these cases krishna or bhakti is the means and brahman is the goal see bhakti is required everywhere we see in the 11th canto uh, maharaj pururava he actually performed a yagya to vishnu and when vishnu came what did he said i want urvashi so for him bhakti was a means but what was happening was the goal was not krishna the goal was an apsara so in karma yoga also there will be some bhakti because they have some conception of they then it's not that they are atheistic obviously but krishna is not their primary goal so they have some devotion that way if you see when what we call as mayavadis they also practice bhakti to some extent you know they will also do kirtans they will also do bhajans but they say yeah ultimately we want to attain brahman so mm-hmm. it's what is the goal that is the important thing yes prabhu thank you prabhu so the so pitraloka those who go to pitraloka when their piety ends do they also come to earth yes that is true so the high, all higher plants are like that they when the punya ends they come back over here so thank you very much grantraj shrimad bhagavat thank you so much prabhu ji ja shla prabhu pad ki jai gaur bhakti thank you so much prabhu ji for hari hari bol class and wonderful very deep explanation jai gauranga thank you for coming on the podcast radhe 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 hari krishna namaste koti gauranga jai hari chaitanya charpat ki jai ho his grace chaitanya rama hari rama rama hari hari gauranga gauranga राधे 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 रा